My name is Wade Rathke. I'm chief organizer of ACORN International. Uh, first, let me just uh, say for Danae and I what an honor it is to be here. Um, as a community organizer for the last 50 years, uh, clearly we know uh, Benjamin Hook's work in the NAACP and the fact of this institute and its purpose. Uh, we're delighted to be here um, to offer uh, some of our experience. This is Danae Butler, who's been a labor and community organizer for the last 10 years and uh, most recently has studied public policy at Hunter College and luckily is able to add some facts to the rest of the opinions that uh, people like me will offer. Um, so ACORN, as many of you know, uh, we work in 15 countries around the world now. We have about 200,000 members. Uh, we deal with housing issues now that are at the level of people trying to get title to places they've squatted in mega slums like Mumbai or San Juan de Ragancho in Lima, as well as people who are organizing tenant unions all over Scotland and England and France and Canada where tenancy and private landlord situations has become the norm as social housing has increasingly disappeared over the last 25 years. But our history is deep in the housing issue. Uh, certainly when I was starting ACORN in 1970, I can remember uh, hitting doors in the east side and central parts of Little Rock and having people explain to me that they were on their second or third contract for deed because what was a contract deed? It was the only way African American families often could get a mortgage because banks were allowed to discriminate against such families. Redlining was FHA policy until 1975. ACORN was involved in, in, in fighting for the, uh, as part of a coalition that won uh, the passage of the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, HMDA, and the Community Reinvestment Act, which supposedly outlawed that level of discrimination in housing based on income, race, ethnicity, et cetera, and forced mortgage lending institutions to have to provide that information on an annual basis and if they were not graded satisfactorily by the Federal Reserve, which was the supervising banking agency, they would not be allowed to open new branches, to merge. There, in the beginning, were penalties. Fast forward to, you know, the foreclosure crisis in 2007, uh, 2008, we thought for 40 years or so that that was one problem that was somewhat solved. You have the, the home ownership uh, implosion where foreclosures, 14 million plus foreclosures happened across the map. You saw a decrease in the rising percentage up to that point of home ownership by African American and Latino families. And all of a sudden, you're in a different world. One thing that we found more recently was part of that different world is that contract for deeds, alternative mortgage arrangements were back. And they were back fiercely. Um, I was sharing with uh, my colleague in the Federal Reserve here earlier, there are more home, more contracts for deeds registered, and nobody registers them, but more were registered in Wayne County which is the county where Detroit's located, then traditional mortgages were registered over the last number of years. We started hearing about this uh, several years ago. Um, we brought together a volunteer army of former organizers, ACORN leaders, people who hadn't changed their names or addresses so that we could still find them. And we went to see people who, and Danae will go through how we found them in Youngstown, in Pittsburgh, in Detroit, Cleveland, um, Indianapolis, Philadelphia, Atlanta, Little Rock, and in Memphis, who we found were part of these, what we'll nicely call alternative mortgage arrangements. And so we, you know, through the foreclosure crisis, we see outside investors purchases go way up, and we're going to go through some of those numbers in a moment. Um, the rental stock increased, alternative mortgages increased, and eviction filings increased. And those are stated eviction filings. And we're going to end our presentation where we talk about policies and ways to improve this. Um, so just 
to start talking about private equity firms. Um, some data points. As recently as 2018, 20% of single family home purchases were made by outside investors in Shelby County. Um, a few of the private equity companies that we looked at, a lot of our data came from the Wall Street Journal, um, where it's Cerberus, um, Prager Private Equity, and then the Blackstone Group Invitation Homes. Cerberus um, became the largest owner of single family homes with nearly 1,800 homes as rentals um, in three years. Uh, Prager in 2014 had 700 rentals. Blackstone um, nationally has 80,000 single home, single family houses and has significant concentrations in, um, in areas around Memphis. Um, and then some of the po data points that were, we found really important is that the property management company for Cerberus, First Key Homes, filed for eviction at twice the rate of other rental home property management companies um, in this county. And then um, throughout the Memphis area between 2015 and 2018, there were 27,000 eviction filings across the Memphis area. Um, and of course, that doesn't include the informal force outs and people who have left, at, which is a lot of what we found in talking to people on the doors, both in Memphis and other areas um, around the country. So what are land installment contracts? Contract for deed is one. There was some action under the passage of Dodd-Frank and the uh, legislative cleanup of sorts after the financial crisis that put formal contract for deeds under the authority of the newly created Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Unfortunately, and before this uh, new administration came in, we were hearing from colleagues and friends that they were about to release regulations that would deal with some of the issues we're talking about in terms of this explosion, but I don't need to tell this crowd the world changed after the election, um, and those regulations never came to light. So what many of these predatory land installment companies did was create other kinds of instruments, not formally a contract for deed that could have them in trouble with uh, CPFB, but in the largest company, Vision Property Management, created an instrument called Lease Purchase Option. Well, it wasn't one and it wasn't another, but what you were doing is paying seven years in a lease to then have an option to purchase the property, meaning you were refinancing the property. The down payment was less than what first and last month's rent would be, and the business model was always the, they would figure out what the market rent was and reduce it by 10 or 15%, making it very attractive. Not just in Memphis, but we've talked to thousands of people in the cities I indicated, no one virtually understood that they were not going to own the house in seven years. Uh, one of our volunteer organizers came back to me one evening uh, in uh, Youngstown and said, I feel like I'm one of the angels of death. <laughs> you know, you, no, I, let's look at your lease. No, I'm sorry to say you don't own the house in seven years. And people would weep and they would ask us uh, what they could do. So this has been... Uh, we started the Acorn Home Savers campaign in order to target Vision, Harbor, and some of these other companies. The largest one of these companies operating, it's a local Memphis company, is Affordable Mortgage. Affordable Housing Property Management Company. Never get the name right. Affordable Housing Management Company, which has about a thousand properties here that they're doing, and their record is mixed. Uh, we were on the doors here. I was part of one visit. They were very happy with the situation. I knew another visit. A young woman, 26 years old, with two children, had signed a contract with them, and she would own her home and get a mortgage and deed to her home in only 56 years. And this was a valid document signed by this local Memphis company. And I know, unfortunately, of no laws that restrict the total length of time for a mortgage. Um, so that's what land installment contracts are, and they're back, unfortunately, and they're right here in River City. We, um, so what we did is um, through our wonderful partners um, with the University of Memphis Regional School of Planning, they actually helped us identify some of these companies that were local 
to the area, or at least the numbers, that there were in fact hundreds to thousands of, um, of contract for deed-like instruments, and that was because they were able to gain access that a regular researcher or organizer wouldn't normally. Um, and then we uh, partnered up with the University of Memphis uh, School of Social Work, and we were able to talk to 80 people on the doors that we'd identified through essentially pretty painful, um, we have a partnership with the University of Michigan. <coughs> they were able to run a number of names of companies that we thought had these kind of contracts. They ran it through their database, came to us with you know, a list of names that we thought might be DBAs for those companies, and then we um, scoured the uh, uh, mortgage recording website or the assessor's website in order to pull lists of potential addresses. And then we went out on the doors and we were able to talk to 80 people thanks to um, the social work volunteers. Um, and essentially we found um, we found a few different points that we thought were the most interesting that we're going to bring up today. But essentially, but you know, one of the things that happens when you're talking to people and you're asking them questions about what their living situation is, is you find out all sorts of things and impacts that you don't, you didn't really start off thinking. And, and one of the examples was a family who was explaining how code enforcement policies were essentially going to end up forcing them out of their home, and that was because. A family that is in an, a land installment contract is neither an owner nor a renter. And so they fall in this gray area where they are mandated to assume financial res responsibility because the owner, the property management company who actually owns the home says, I'm not going to do this. You, you are culpable. You, you, are, you are the owner even though they don't have a deed. Um, and they're they have to either pay the fines and repair and maintain the home um, and were unable to pay to move an electrical wire. And so part of you know our conversation with them was not only understanding that they were in a land installment contract, it was not their first. The friends of theirs who were in their front yard had also been a land installment contract and had lost their home previously. And that there was also, you know, we started to think about unintended consequences of policies that are meant to do good and how this gray area of regulation impacts families. Um, when we were talking to people, we really wanted to understand some points of, like, of what people understood about the contract. And so we really asked, like, what kind of contract are you in? Are you renting? Do you own your home? Are you in a contract for deed? And so what we found is that, you know, it's 20% of people believe they were in a mortgage. Um, 32% lease to purchase, 12% um, un understood that they were in a land contract. Um, and so we bring up this because it's important to understand that there's still like 20% of the 50 total that answered that believe they were in a mortgage. And in all of the research that we had done and in all of the contracts that we'd seen, that was, is likely not true. Um, and so part of what we were having to do is talk to people about whether or not we could see their contracts to show them at what points and which leverage they had um, depending on which company they uh, were tied to. And then the next was what were their top motivators for entering in these contracts? Um, you know, this is like kind of like a snapshot. And we really found people still really wanted to own their own homes. The American dream still there. People wanted to pass on generational wealth and that those were the times of types of like qualitative answers we heard from people. And then almost virtually the other 50% were in an emergency housing crisis and that's why they entered in these contracts. Or they found that this was the most affordable housing that they could find. And that's because the more research you do into how these companies <coughs> price their monthly note is that they're priced a certain percentage under the average market and with the intention that more people will find it affordable over time with this like illustrative notion that they will own the home at the end of the day. Um, and then finally, this is an even tinier snapshot, very small sample size of the number of people who answered this question, but what was their previous housing experience we wanted to know? And you know, only a few people answered, but bankruptcy, foreclosure, eviction, and then people who'd been in these failed owner finance contracts. 
So now we're going to talk about what we think we could do about it. I mean, obviously, this is a terrible problem, and there's almost nothing that's being done about it. So let's be frank on the front end. Our strategy on this campaign was to go directly against the companies. Uh, we did get some progress by demanding to Fannie Mae that they no longer allow any company using any form of alternative mortgage from being able to participate in auctions. But that's a little bit like shutting the proverbial barn door after most of the cows are out. I mean, the auctions are getting smaller and smaller, but that did force Vision Property Management, the company we particularly targeted, to have to change, or at least uh, we're trying to see how much they've changed their policies. There is some model legislation, not in Tennessee. Um, the best is actually in Texas. I, I didn't surprise anybody, I know. Um, 1996 in Texas, an Equity Protection Act uh, that ACORN helped get passed then, um, argued that if you had paid 40% of the contract and the contract and you didn't fulfill the full contract, you would have refunded your down payment and the value of any improvement you'd made in that property. So you did recover some of the equity. Now you had to make 40%, but still that's the best. California and Arizona have done some, uh, have made some similar uh, protections, not as much as Texas. Um, there are other uh, things that you can tell from our earlier comments we believe need to be done. One is, if private equity companies are going to be involved in issuing mortgages, they need to be under the supervision of the Federal Reserve in terms of CRA and HMDA protection. This would seem to be a no-brainer. Unfortunately, um, a thousand banking lobbyists in Congress and what, what's brains worth. Um, but these, these contracts all need to be mandated in whatever form they are to be registered with uh, the local counties or whatever the uh, registration for property is so that the full terms are known. They have to be, there has to be transparency. There are some requirements uh, that they're being inspected. Most of those are not fulfilled. Um, we need some progress on code enforcement in terms of understanding what income and ownership and Danae cited the problem of the Clarks. We, I was doing work in Milwaukee earlier this year, and there was a program Milwaukee had that they would help a family replace a roof, $20,000, CDBG money. But you had to prove that you had title. So all the families in the Imani neighborhood, the poorest neighborhood in the city of Milwaukee, who were in contracts of this kind, could never prove that they had title. So. Same thing for FEMA protection after uh, the hurricane in New Orleans, where we live. If you couldn't prove title, you couldn't get home to you couldn't get money to rebuild your home. And this is the way. I mean, the articles were outstanding in a recent New Yorker and Harper's on the la the, the loss of uh, black land ownership in the South because of collective deeds where everybody in the family has to sign. And once again. I was shocked to find that there were 20,000 families who couldn't get FEMA money after Hurricane Katrina. I don't want to digress into Hurricane Katrina. Where am I going? <laughs> help me, help me. What are, what are our um, policy recommendations here? Right. And so the other, <laughs> the other ones that, you know, we think, you know, model legislation is out there. It might be hard to get passed. We're not saying that, like, this is all happening tomorrow. But New York recently passed rental regulations that discourage large landlords from passing on maintenance and repair costs by capping rental increases at 2%. And they, of course, have mandatory inclusionary zoning requirements, requirements that mandate affordable housing for new developments. Something like that. We would like something like that. But, but even though laws passed uh, in Oregon for the statewide rental control and in, the, and in many other areas are allowing 5 to 7% rent increases. That's a big rent increase, frankly. That's, I mean, for all this blah, 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 landlords and everybody's crying like stuck pigs that rent control will stop them ever building a house, if you know you can get 5 to 7% every year, that's, I mean, I don't know what they're looking for, but. Uh, yeah, so we, our paper has a number of other statistics stats we did we were not stats heavy um, we were policy heavy on this and um, but within our paper you can find uh, 
more data points. Otherwise, this is who we are, and if you have any questions. Or comments if you yeah. read the thing, and certainly we look forward to everybody's questions and answers, and we're finishing on time, which, uh, you know, I'm glad to, we were able to do that. And, and thank you again us. for being able to have us.